Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about this. Well, not the clock itself. This is a regular wall mount clock, but I did a modification on it. And if I switch it on, you can see it is setting the time. And now, the, uh, we I did an LED modification, which I'm calling the LED clock, which is there to show you how much time passed. In green, we have the number of minutes which pass of the hour. You can see it, so it's the same. In blue, we have the number of hours pass in this half day. And then in red, which you can see here, this is the seconds which are passing. And the idea behind this LED clock is to give a visual and colorful representation of how much time passed. So in, in blue you can see with like a progress bar, or in green and blue you can see like a progress bar how much minutes of the hour passed or how much hour of the 12 hours passed, so of one midday. And yeah, let's go to it and see how I built this LED clock modification. The most important part to build an LED clock are, well, the LEDs. And for this project, I'm using this LED strip. It's one meter long and it has 60 of these LEDs. These are WS2812B LEDs. So they are RGB LEDs and they are individually controllable. To control them, you just need to provide ground, five volts, and then transmit the data over this wire. And the data goes to each individual LED and this way you can control the color of each LED. I already spoke about these LEDs in a previous project but, but I like them and they fit the purpose so I will reuse them and I will also describe how they work a bit more briefly. I used a one meter LED strip because I, it needs to be taped all around the LED strip also on the circumference and with a clock with a diameter of 30, 33 centimeters you can fit one meter of, uh, of LED strip. My clock is a bit smaller so they won't fit all on it. Also here there are 60 LEDs per meter but you can buy them also with 30 LED per meters or 120 LED per meters. For this one I paid around $15 and they fit the purpose so we'll use this. This is a closer look at the WS2812B RGB LED. If you have a closer look at it, you can see one, two, and three LEDs for red, green, and blue. Although I don't know which one is which one. And then on top of it, you have a small integrated circuit, which is there to control these LEDs. So to control them, you just send data over this data in pin, which gets processed by this integrated circuit. And this will set the duty cycle of each individual of these three LEDs. This way you control the brightness and by controlling the brightness of the red, green and blue LEDs you can control the color of this LED. And whenever you send even more data over data in, it will transmit them, relay it over data out. And this way you can control one LED and then if you send even more data you can control the next LED because it gets data from data in. Let's go through this data sheet to check how to control this WS2812B RGB LED. Um, and actually it is made by World Sami. So in the beginning we have a short description of the LED with all its feature. So that's the summary and here we have the connection. On pin 1 we have VDD which is 5 volts. On pin 3 we have VSS which is we connect to ground. On pin 4 there is data in, so this is where they send the data and on pin 2 we have data out. So whenever we send too much data into data in, the integrated circuit will just forward to data out and this way we can control even more LEDs. So here you can have an LED where data is coming in. If we continue sending data we can send even more data to even more LEDs and this way we can chain these RGB LEDs, which is quite nice. And then we have the electrical characteristics, which is not too interesting. What is interesting is here the protocol to communicate with these LEDs and actually to control what will be shown on the LED. So whenever we want to send a zero, 
then we have to go high for a certain amount of time being t0 and then we are low for another amount of time t0 low for one it is almost the same thing we are high in the beginning low in the end but the difference is the duration of the high if it's if the high is longer if the signal is longer on high then it's a one if it's shorter on high if it's not as long it's a zero that's how to make the difference and this re return code or the reset is just that um, this way you stay okay i've sent all my data please apply it to it so the times are here and as you can see always the time for high and the time for low is always 1.25 microseconds the time be for being high between 0 and 1 which is the most important it's 0 0.4 microseconds or 0 0.8 microseconds so I have 0 0.4 microseconds difference between the two and then the time for being low just is this time minus this time and this is where we reach these times and for the reset we just have to stay low for 50 milliseconds and then they know the data works so the transfer to send the data it works this way now d1 is the first led and the data is coming into d1 into data in of the first led which is called pixel one then it's the the data is going out to d2 which is connected to the pix2 led and so on so whenever we send the data the f into d1 the first led will store the first 24 bits we are sending whatever comes after the 24 bits is forwarded over the d out pin to d2 and this goes to the second led and the second led will again take the first 24 bits which are the second one and forward the rest to d3 and so on after so the here it takes the d3 takes the next 24 LEDs and if you waited if you have sent all the data you just wait for 50 milliseconds 50 microseconds and all the LEDs know okay there's no transmission of data whatever I've get I got here I will apply it to my LEDs and 24 bits are used to store three values red green and blue and every value has eight bits so here we have green then we have red and then we have blue and this is what the 24 bits are coding so this is how you set the RGB LEDs the color for each single LED and then you just shift the data the first approach to implement this protocol would be to use bit banging bit banging simply means to use the GPIO of the microcontroller and set the output to low or to high so since the protocol looking at this protocol you set by you start by setting it to high here you wait this amount of time but you can compare if it's a zero or if a one if it's a zero then you set it to low then you have this amount of time if it's a one you set it to low and here it is already low and you are waiting until you're here again and this corresponds to the beginning where you set it to high and then you transmit the other bit now there is one small trick you can use is that here you don't have to do the comparison you already did the comparison one and the signal is low if it's a zero so what you can do here is set it to low so if it's a one it will all it will also go low and then it will stay low that's the the first improvement now to implement this bit banging i in the beginning so in a past project used the 80 mega 328p which is used by the arduino so it's a quite well known microcontroller it works at 20 megahertz uh, 20 megahertz and you might think that 20 megahertz is quite a lot but this whole one bit sending one bit transmission only takes 1.25 microseconds and that means that you only have 25 instructions if you're running at 
20 megahertz to to accomplish the transmission per bit so here you have eight instruction eight instructions until this point here you have eight instructions until this point because this is 0 0.4 microseconds 0 0.4 microseconds and then we have 0 0.4 45 microseconds and this is nine instructions so this is microseconds and these are instructions that's not a lot so and the issue is that the timing is quite critical so you need this eight instructions and even if you have your results completed before you have to wait until it's here so you don't use c because c in c it's hard to control what happens in the end and the optimizer will do something so maybe it won't it will not use eight instructions instead you program in assembly and in assembly in assembly you can control which instruction is controlled and you know you have eight instructions to do it so you can perfectly fit the timing how it works is that here i set the signal to high no matter what happens here I have the time to do a comparison if it's a, to check if it's a zero or a one. If it's a zero here, I will set it to low. Oh, sorry, that's, I will set it to low. Here, no matter what happens, I will set it to low again. And what I do here is loading load is load the next value so here I can set it to high and here I can do the comparison with the next value because I want to send bits all the time so at some point I need to to load the next bits and the loading happens here so I have eight cycles to do the instructions I could also do something here but it's it's not too important this this is the basic principle the other Non advantage is that microcontrollers generally work with bytes and not with bits. It's pretty hard to load single bits and to do comparisons on single bits. Generally, it's done on single bytes, and whenever you want to do it on bits, you have to do it on a byte and then interpret it as a bit. So, the issue is that to transmit one bit, uh, whenever I do the load instruction, I load uh, load one byte one byte and this is eight bits so i'm only using one and then i can um i I, I compare this one byte and this one byte will tell if i set the output to um low or high just right here so here we have one byte of usage for every eight uh, we use only one bit out of the eight bit information because on this output we only need one bit but because of microcontroller work with eight bits we have to load eight bits all the time um, you could use this disadvantage as advantage and then have eight ports so here it is one bit for one port so simply if you use eight ports in parallel then you use the eight bits Eight bits for every byte you're you're loading. So this is a quite quite a good use. But this is if you have only uh, if you have if you want to control eight LED strips. Um, for our project, we will only control one LED strip. So we have one bit for eight bits, and this is quite a waste of waste of memory. The other problem is that. You need to uh, you need to be very precise with the timing. You don't want any instruction to go through it, so you are blocking every interrupt service routine. And the code implemented is assembly because it's software bit banging, so it's big banging. It's implemented in software. The CPU usage is hundred percent, so you cannot do anything else in parallel to to this software bit banging implementation of the protocol for these LEDs. We already know what LEDs we will use for our LED clock. Now we need something to drive them and for that we will use this development board. Um, this is based on an 
STM32 F103 microcontroller, um, which uses an ARM Cortex M3 core, and then ST added a lot of peripherals. So the board is pretty simple. You just have a programming port here, the S of serial wire debug. Here you have some switches with jumpers to select which bootloader mode you want to start. Here a simple reset button, two LEDs, and here we have a crystal oscillator uh, of 8 MHz, but the microcontroller which run at 72 MHz. And this is a, small, a micro USB port also for communication. And we can see lots of IOs. Um, I'm using this board because it is really cheap. It's often referred as the blue pill. Um, you can get it for 250. And for 250, you get a 32 bits microcontroller, which is quite powerful. So that's why I'm using this one. As we've seen, the bit banging implementation is not very efficient. Simply because for this project, we will only have one LED strip. It means that we will use only one bit out of every byte, so eight bits we want to, to load. So that's a memory waste. The other thing is the CPU waste, because we have very strict timings, we have to implement in assembly and be sure that nothing interrupts our, our flow. So we disable all internet service routine and no other code can run in parallel. So we would have a 100% CPU usage. And knowing that we will use the STM32 F103 microcontroller, which runs at 72 megahertz, it is even more waste than with the 80 mega where I did this picking implementation because this was running only at 20 megahertz. Now this is not good. We don't want to have the bit banging software implementation. What we want to do is somehow use the hardware to implement this protocol. And when it comes to sending one bit after another over one line, there's a peripheral called SPI and stands for Serial Peripheral Interface. And the idea is that you load data into a register, so eight bits, and every time it will shift out one bit after another. This is a shift register. So it will every time do one bit shift out out of the eight bits, one bit after another, and it does this on clock edges. Here I've writ, uh, I've drawn a rising clock, but it can um, also be a falling clock. That's all there is behind SPI, software peripheral interface. And this inset peripheral is something which is very common and you find it in lots of microcontrollers. You don't have to use this microcontroller. Even the 80 mega has this peripheral interface. So you could use even the 80 mega to implement this. Now what we want to shift out are three bits. Here we want to shift a zero. Here we want to shift a zero or a one. This is our data bit. At this point, we want to shift a zero to set the level to low. And here is again the beginning where we shift on, where we shift out the one, so we have a high level. Already here we can see that we have one data bit, this one, out of three data bits of memory which we need to allocate. And this is better than the one bit out of eight bits which we're using, using software bit banging. So the memory usage is already better. The other thing which is important is now the clock. For serial peripheral interface, you don't need a very precise, uh, uh, it, you need a clock. Generally clock are periodic. And this whole transmission here takes 1.25 uh, microseconds. So for the first phase, for this phase, you have 0 0.4 microseconds. Here we have again 0 0.4 and here we have 0 0.45 microseconds. This is not very periodic. If you would have to divide this whole bit transmission cycle by three, you would arrive to 0 0.417 microseconds. It's not very far from the 0 
four actually. And if you look at the data sheet here, this is the transfer time, but there is kind of a margin which you can use. So the maximum would be 0 0.415 uh, microseconds because of this margin. And we want 0 0.417 microseconds. And actually, the LEDs work with it. Even with this, if we use three times 0 0.417 microseconds, it works pretty nice. So now we can have a very periodic clock which generates this. And every time this is 0 0.417 microseconds, same here, same, um, same here. To generate this clock, we will have to we we can use a PVM. So we already can shift out the data using SPI. Now we need to generate a clock with this period. And for that we will use a timer which we will output a PVM output actually which so pulse with modulation. And using this timer you can in hardware set whenever something uh output goes high, when it goes low you simply using this PVM. PVMs also are hardware peripherals which you find in almost every microcontroller. And combining, putting PVM into this clock, we can then use the software peripheral interface. And as we can see, we already get rid of a lot of the, inform, uh, a lot of the headache with, we had with Bitbang. Now there's a last thing here, we have to load eight bits all the time. So whenever the eight bits uh, are transmitted, are shifted out, we need to load 8 bits again. The advantage of this microcontroller is it has another peripheral called DMA, which stands for Direct Memory Access, and the idea uh, behind is that it will read for from one memory and put it in another memory whenever something happens. So in this case, whenever this shift register is empty, um, you program the direct memory access to read from one memory and to put it in a memory. So the one memory you want uh, is the RGB values and the other memory is this shift register. With that we have no CPU usage anymore because everything is done in hardware. We shift out the data using SPI. Uh, for the clock we use the PVM and for Filling the register, we use the DMA. The only thing which you need is actually generating this pattern, this zero and then zero or one, zero. You need to, to put this in memory. So whenever you want to change the colors of an LED, you have to generate this pattern um, in memory and fill the memory so the DMA can read from the memory and put it in the shift register. So there is a bit of CPU usage, but at one point or another, you want to set the LED color. So you will always have to have some, some calculation done. And here you just need some calculation to, to generate this pattern. pattern. And this is the only thing which is important and the rest is done in hardware. And here is my development setup. Here we have the WS2812B RGB LEDs. Here we have a development board. I'm using this one instead of the blue pill simply because it has more power ports on the back and a bit more connections so it makes development a bit easier. But else it's exactly the same microcontroller. It's an STM32F103. This is connected over USB to this hub. This connection, USB connection is mainly there for power. Um, I could also use to flash or to have serial communication, but for now it's only uh, to power the, the board. Next to it we have an ST-Link V2 clone. This is an SVD adapter which I'm, used to, which I'm using here on the back to program this microcontroller. And here we have a USB to UART converter, which is also connected on the back. And this allows me to debug the microcontroller or to have some status messages of what's happening. 
You are also seeing here a small board. This is simply a um, level shifter because these LEDs operate at 5 volts. So you can see here that we have a connection. The red wire is 5 volt from the power port. The black wire is ground. And the blue wire is going to this level shifter. And then from this level shifter, it goes to this board. And the level shifter simply converts the 3.3 volt, which this microcontroller operates at, to the 5 volt, which are required by these LEDs. Now, let's have a look at the how to talk to these LEDs. The blue probe here is channel 2 of this oscilloscope and it is connected to the blue cable. Now, the blue cable, we've seen that it goes to this level shifter and then from the level shifter to the LEDs. This is actually the data signal and this is where we will send data to control the color value of these RGB LEDs. So. We are using the SPI interface, the SPI peripheral from the microcontroller. This blue pin is the MISO pin, so master input slave output. The microcontroller is, the SPI port of the microcontroller is configured as slave. So because it is a slave, th this MISO port slave output means that the microcontroller will output data over this pin. We want it to be a slave because we want to feed in the SPI a very precise clock which generates the right boat rate for this for the data stream for these LEDs. And this is the cable which you see here. This gray cable, which is connected just next to the MISO port, is actually the clock port of the SPI. And it is connected on the back to this pin. And this pin is simply the output of a timer. So the output of a timer generates a clock, which we feed back in the slave SPI, which so this is the clock, and then data will be output here. As you can see the clock is connected to channel 1 of the oscilloscope, so this probe. Now let's start it, and normally you should see the LEDs go on here. Here you're seeing the LEDs going on, so this demos that the, board, the implementation actually works. And if we have a look at the oscilloscope, Channel 1, which you see here, is actually the, um, the clock. If we have a precise look, we can see that the clock has a period of 417 nanoseconds. And this is exactly the um, period which we wanted to generate, to send one bit to the microcontroller, uh, to the um, LEDs. So this must perfectly, and then if you put the second channel, this is the data channel to control the LEDs. Uh, the color of the LEDs and now if we switch back we have to wait until the clock so these are all the bits which are shifted and let's wait until the LEDs have made the round and then started here again and here you can see that the LED is moving so these were the color values of the LEDs maybe if I switch one back again yeah you can still see that here there's some some value and this is the the green and blue color which is fading in. So with that I've proven that the SPI interface works and it's a quite nice implementation because it doesn't use it doesn't use a lot of memory and everything is done in hardware except generating the pattern one for the when setting the color of the LEDs. Now that we have the LEDs for the LED clock we need the second part, the clock because we want to display the time on the LEDs, we somehow have to get the information what time it is. And for this, in the beginning, I used this module here. This is the tiny RTC module. RTC stands for real-time clock. And it's mainly based around this chip here. This is, as you can see here, a DS1307. And the sole purpose of this chip is to have a real-time clock. So it using this oscillator here, it can keep track of the time. This crystal oscillator runs at 32.765 kHz. And while you would think that this is an odd frequency, actually it's power of it's a power of two. It's two power fifteen. And as we know with computers, 
which calculate in binary, powers of 2 are really easy to divide. So this way it can, from this frequency, divide one second and then count every second. That's what this chip does. This module comes with other chips. For example, this one, this is an I2C EEPROM with 32 bits, kilobits. It's a uh, 24C32. And then you can also even have the last module here, which is a temperature sensor. Um, uh, one we speaking wire wire and temperature sensor is a DS18B20. But what's important on the back side is this battery. To keep, tra to keep track of time, you need somehow to keep calculating and oscillating. So this, so whenever there is no power uh, provided on the pins, this battery will provide power to this tiny IC. This tiny IC will keep the oscillator running and then count the seconds. So even if there is no power, this chip will keep track of time and whenever you power it on again you can speak I2C to it. So here are the connections for I2C. That's why we have the I2C here and over I2C you can read out what time it is because it keeps counting it. And here uh, you can simply read out the minutes, the seconds, the current year, the current month, the current day. Um, it does the calculation for you. You don't have to, from one counter, which is counted from this clock, to deri derivate everything. The chip does it for you. So it's a pretty simple chip and we'll use it now on our, um, on our development board. Here's the setup. The LEDs, the microcontroller and the real-time clock. And now the uh, microcontroller, so our firmware, wants to read out the time from this module. So we've connected it to that and to speak to this uh, real-time clock, we're using the I2C protocol for low-speed communication and with multiple devices, this is a quite common protocol. Oh, up. <laughs> we will see here, this is my debug output. We will switch it on. And as you can see, it tries to read out the date. And it does, in the beginning, it says that the RTC oscillator is disabled. This is simply because it hasn't been is initialized. And you can see the date is one of the first dates which is set in here. So the first thing we need to change is the time and date. So time, it's 10, 33, 27. Dates, we are 2016-04-10. Up. Now we have both time and date set. Time, date, as you can see, it works. And you can even see that the it, it already counted up. And this is what I've programmed in the firmware. I can read out and I can send the data. Now, if I switch off, up. So it is switched off. This thing is not pro provided power anymore. This thing is also not provided power anymore, but it has the backup battery. So normally it should continue counting up. So here we have 10, 33, 38. If we switch it back on, we can see that it continued counting up. And we don't have the warning anymore that the RTC oscillator is, is not running because by setting the date, we set the RTC, we enabled it also. And yeah, everything is running smooth. So it will continue counting up, it will change the date, it will change the time, and it will, even if there is no power, it will continue doing this. We can now read the date and time from this real-time clock module. But another important part of a clock is to be able to update the time because you want to show the seconds which are passing, really the time which is passing. So one way to do this would be simply to request all the time, the time from this real-time clock. And if you see that one second passed based on the information, then you update the LEDs. This is not very efficient or and not very clean because you will always have to request the date and time. So it's a lot of I2C traffic. Um, a better way would be to implement a timer in this microcontroller here so that every second you wake up and then you can also ask the time from this RTC module to verify if really one second passed. But there's something even better. This chip offers a square wave output, which is often labeled as SQ, like here. 
and this is where I've connected the oscilloscope probe. So you can configure to ch the chip to generate a square wave output and to have a period, for example, of one second. So here, we've connected to the microcontroller. Every second, the mic this real-time clock will generate a square wave output, which will wake up the microcontroller, and then the microcontroller knows, okay, because there's activity on this pin here, one second passed. So you do I don't even need to read the time all the time, I just need it to read it once, and then every time there's activity on this square wave output, I know one second passed. So this is better. And what's even better is that you don't ha it you can configure it for various periods. So you can use it a square wave output of one hertz, so for one second, but you can also set it to other frequencies. And for example, here we will use 4096 hertz. And if I enable it, tech, so now we have the time. And if we see here, we have a frequency of 9,000, uh, 4,096 uh, hertz. And this is the square wave output of the pin. What's useful to have it updated that fast instead of just one second, because you want to display one second, is to be able to fade the color. So every time it changes LED every second, but let's switch it on again so we can see it better. So here, every second it changes LED, but while it changes the LED, it fades in and out. Because we have the updated time, we can just divide this time and set the brightness of the LED depending on how much of the second passed. And here it's coming back. So that's quite useful. And using this module, it is pretty efficient because it will generate a square wave output automatically. This just needs to be programmed to trigger on, on the signal. And now we can count time. We just have to get the time in the beginning, and then we use the square wave output to update the time and to update the time which we show on the LEDs. I'm using this real time clock to get the time because I just want to display the time on the um, LEDs. And you might say that this is silly using this module because this chip here already has an RTC capability, so it can also do the real time clock. Yes. That's true. And I just wanted to use this module because it was lying around and I really wanted to try it out. It's a nice small board and it works quite well. But this chip can do exactly the same. And you can see here, this footprint, it's very similar to this one. Here you can put a low speed crystal oscillator like this one, so 32.768 kilohertz, and then this microcontroller can also have the same functionality as this one, meaning keeping track of time. It does the really real-time business. Uh, on this board, it is not populated. We don't have the clock. We could put it on, but we don't need because this blue pill already has the clock. This is what you want you see just here. So this is the main oscillator for the CPU, and this is the low-speed oscillator for the real-time clock. And it also had 32.768 kilohertz. Not only can it count time using this oscillator, it can also keep the real-time clock running when it's not powered. And for this, we have here, VB, voltage battery. So you can connect the same way one three volt lithium battery just on this pin. And when there is no power provided by the USB port, the microcontroller will still keep this can still keep this oscillator running and can keep the real-time clock unit on this microcontroller running so it can count up time. And this is what we will do now. Here's the next setup. And now we're using the Blue Pill development board with the embedded low-speed crystal oscillator, which we'll use to power this real-time clock unit inside. And you can already see that the second LED which we have here, the user LED is blinking. So every second it is toggling showing that it is counting time. And here you can also see on these LEDs that the time is getting incremented every second. On the back here you can see this 3 volt cell coin battery which I've connected to the microcontroller. 
using this battery pin. So whenever I switch off, so let's have a look at where is the red LED. Should be coming somewhere. Here's the red LED. Whenever I switch off the microcontroller and switch it back on, it should keep track of time and you can see that the LED is continuing where it left, just there. So it did a bit of turn and now it is still running. So the real-time clock is working synced to this battery. Um, I've also connected this battery to a second pin to do so, which is performing analog to a digital conversion, so I can read out the voltage of the battery. This way I can know if the battery is low or not. Now, this is a bit risky because whenever you switch off the microcontroller, um, there will still be some power drained and uh, through the ADC, so through the pin. The microcontroller will, so this, the microcontroller will try to still be powered up using power which is coming from this ADC pin. Uh, and this will drain this battery quite fast because it will try to power the LEDs, it will try to power the microcontroller and so on. This will not last long. So either you don't connect to the ADC, so you don't read out the voltage, or uh, my trick here was to use um, a transistor, the th small thing here. So whenever the power is cut, I uh, the transistor is blocking the power, the current to go through this ADC pin. And this way, I can still use the bat the cell coin and read the voltage whenever it is on. And this battery is not used when it is powered. This battery is only used by the microcontroller when there's no power anymore, so it can keep the real-time clock running. One last feature I wanted to implement is setting the brightness of these LEDs. As you can see, these can be quite bright, and during the night, when the clock is hanging on the wall, you don't want it to light the whole room because of these LEDs. You want somehow to dim them. For that, I will use a photoresistor. So this is the photoresistor. It's a 5528 photoresistor, that's the common name, and it is pretty simple. The resistance of this device changes with the brightness. So this is quite bright, it has a low resistance, and when it is getting darker, it has a higher resistance. Here, again, bright, low resistance, dark, high resistance. And I've connected this using a um, resistor divider to another ADC on the microcontroller so I can simply measure the voltage drop and using, um, using this variable resistor divider I can know how bright or uh, how much the resistance of this device is and this way I know how bright or dark it is and now if I make it really dark so with my finger you can see that the LEDs are dimming and this is completely black and the LEDs are not shining a lot anymore and if I'm leveling it on and if it recognizes that it's done uh, daylight inside and uh, outside and bright the LEDs will be bright again and this is proportional to the brightness and that was the last feature I wanted to implement before mounting it on the clock and I will mount it this is the wall clock I will mount the LED modification on. Ideally, you want a clock which has 32 centimeters of diameter, so the LED tape, the one meter LED tape, can do the whole circumference. But if it's smaller, it's not too much an issue. Too much an issue. For example, this one has 25 centimeters of diameter, yeah, something like 25. So not all 50, uh, not all 60 LEDs fit, but we have less we have 48 LEDs which fit and then 12 LEDs are remaining and it's not too much of a problem the code is adapted for for this so you can set any number of LEDs and it will just scale the time to these LEDs so we just have to change in the source code that we're using only 48 LEDs or if you're using a tape which has even more LEDs per meter for example 120 change it in the code and that's it now we are mounting it here we have the LED clock modifications, so the LEDs here mounted on a regular wall clock. Now, how 
this time showing works is that the LED show how much time we, sp we uh, passed. So as you can see, the green LED match the minute handler. The blue LEDs here match the, the hour handler. And instead of just pointing which hour it is, the idea be be behind this LED clock is to show how much time passed. So these are 12 hours and you can see that we are, we've almost complete, completed the 12 hours because those blue LEDs almost finished the circle. So it's kind of a progress bar. Here, similarly with the green LEDs, which show you the number of minutes which pass of the hour, you can see that the green LED almost completed half of a circle, so half an hour, of an hour passed. And it won't show you exactly how much time passed. For this, you still have the minute and um, hour hands, but it gives more enough of an uh, impression of how much time passed, which was actually the purpose just to have a nice colorful impression of how much time passed and these are progress bar. The second here is not a progress bar, here is a running red LED. Probably it's hard to see with this brightness but here as you can see there's running red LED and when it comes here you will see here is the red LED coming and here you can see these are the seconds and it is fading in and out because you can set the brightness of these LEDs and the brightness of the LED correspond to how much of a second passed. Similarly for the clock LED. Here the hour, this is half brightness of this one because half an hour passed. And for the minutes, you have the same here. This is not the full brightness simply because um, here is the second LED and it is not completed. What it is com once it is completed, this is almost full minute completed. Now it's not completely a full minute because to be a full minute I would have to have 60 LEDs. I only have 48 LEDs so uh, this scales proportionally to the number of LEDs you have. So again not too precise but it, it gives an impression of the progress of time instead of what time it is. Um, yeah and here you can still see the LEDs running. Now if we look at the back I mounted the LEDs on the outside of the clock. I've made a hole so I can put the cables inside. And here again we have the cables for the LEDs. This is the microcontroller. You can see this blinking every second. So toggling every second. Here we have the backhead battery so the real-time clock can continue running even if there is no power. This transistor is to prevent the microcontroller to drain the battery when there's no power. And here we have the voltage divider and the sensor. So here is the sensor to measure the brightness and adjust the LED brightness. So if I cover it, it thinks it's night. And here you can see that the LEDs are a lot more dim. If it's getting bright again, the LEDs are getting brighter. And to provide power, you need to connect a micro USB cable and provide 5 volts. So there's a hole here. Um, I need a micro USB cable uh, to provide external 5 volts because this battery wouldn't last long. LEDs quite consume quite a lot of power, so it is not designed for this. But that's the only inconvenience of this modification, is to need external 5 volt power. Also, you can set the time through USB. So when you connect to the computer, this USB is recognized as a serial port. You just connect to it and type time. You set the time and yeah, that's it. This way you can update the time in case it's there is a time shift of one hour or things like that. Um, this wall is, this clock is radio controlled. I don't have radio control and this one th which is here it is doing by itself. It could be a nice modification to add radio control to it. But now it is simple enough. This is a Easy modification and connecting through USB to set the time is also not too hard. That's the LED clock modification. Like always, the documentation is in the wiki, the source code is in the kit. And enjoy!